they say that we're shrinking them down. So having comprehensive care and access for everyone would eliminate that. Um, and then a uh, single public agency that process pays bills. So you lose some of that bureaucracy that comes into billing and then, uh, also administrative funds. All right, so a huge question people have is how can we pay for this kind of system? So our current system is paid for in a slightly complicated way. You, with your health insurance, you, you pay private insurers or your employers do. Um, and then those insurers in turn pay the health care providers. Um, you also pay taxes to the government and the state. And those state taxes are then used for Medicaid, um, state employees. And then uh, you also pay out-of-pocket expenses to providers that's not covered by your insurance. That's why when you have to go to the doctor and you have a large copay that you're expecting, um, you're, you're not only paying, you're paying in multiple ways, essentially. So the way single payer healthcare is structured, you pay the government and then the government pays the healthcare providers. So you're automatically enrolled and everyone receives a card assuring payment for the needed care. And then the public agencies are the ones who process and pay the bills for you. Um, you. The way that this is funded is paying progressive taxes. So taxing the wealthy more than taxing the poor and then the government has funds to pay for Healthcare needs. Um, so this can also help eliminate some of the administrative waste. As you can see, it's a like huge to the government to healthcare providers rather than many different um, agencies that are then paying the providers for you. Um, the government also has increased bargaining for budgets and services. And then you have a healthcare card that you can give to the providers, charge your plan, and you don't need to deal with copays and deductibles. Um, Physicians for National Health Program, EHP, estimated an immediate savings of $350 billion per year in the single care model. So, we have some exciting legislation coming up, and we want you to be aware of it. So, Washington State has two bills on the House, one in the Senate, there are many bills, um, that are going to propose creating a work group to study the issue and make recommendations for a universal health care system for Washington State by November 2020. So this is a great first step in exploring how would we pay for universal health care for our state um, and, and how would it be structured. And then we also have on a national scale um, Bernie's bill and Pramila's bills, um, which will be released Wednesday, February 27th for Pramila's. Um, and these are ideal singer, single payer plans. Um, the, they focus on primary preventative care, um, prescription drugs, emergency care, um, they include transportation, uh, they include long-term care, mental health services, dental services, and vision care. Um, so these are things to keep an eye out for and contact your legislators when they do, um, when the bills are finalized. So we know you didn't come here to listen to us around, but thank you for listening. If you want to give a big thank you to PNHP, they provided a substantial amount of money for us to be able to uh, have food for everyone here today. And then um, also, uh, thank you, Dr. Lindo, for coming out today. And just a quick introduction on Dr. Lindo. He works in the Department of Family Medicine. He actually went to law school here, and he um, currently, I mean, any of the med students, we've seen him in EHM, so we're pretty familiar with his work. And yeah, he's going to get us through a talk today. So thank you, guys. I think that's a good primer for everyone that's a bit of understanding of where we are with a single payer universal health care. Uh, I am an educator and organizer at heart, and so I would like to just stand up here and lecture what I'm hoping today to be for us to garner the experience, the expertise that's in the room. Uh, we have some elders in the room that I think <laughs> are uh, and I say that respectfully. I, I hope to be uh, we respect our opportunities, but with that comes knowledge, experience, and we have some young folks in the room that are perhaps new to this conversation about universal health care, single care. And what I'd like to see is maybe we have a dialogue of what work has been done, for those of you that are aware of it, and uh, what are the potential challenges. And the parts I'm going to drop in are questions. I like to ask. And so before we get to the dialogue, I'm, I'm wondering if, if someone can share with us 
what is the potential? And let me start off with saying I support single care, I support universal health care, I am a recipient of Medicare in California, of Medi-Cal, of all public health care that was provided. I was raised by a single dad on welfare. Were it not for these programs, I would not be able to get out of the program. Out. And so I understand the benefits of it. That being said, we live in a society and we are in a place. And I've seen it firsthand in the medical schools where the care that is being provided, we see it through the research, we see it through the news that says, for example, that black women or hospital women are dying at a higher rate than any other race in this country. It doesn't necessarily matter what health care you have, if something happened in the hospital that we haven't questioned, that we haven't critiqued, or that we haven't figured it out. Uh, we know what it is, it is racism, it's institutional racism. When I say we haven't figured it out, we haven't figured out, unfortunately, how we expunge that of our, of our providers, of the care that we're providing. Um, and so I, I bring that up because when we talk about universal health care, I want us to question what are the potential gaps are. Does universal health care mean that we address the issues like the one I just mentioned about institutional racism within medicine. What do we think? <laughs> yes. I think that bringing everybody into the system with a single payer system creates a platform upon which an improved healthcare delivery system can be built that can include solutions yeah. to problems of inequity and inequalities. I, I think sometimes we have cultural issues, mm -hmm. like the modern. Um, my grandparents lived in Italy, and to go to the hospital when she you were dying, you were dead, mm -hmm. you might just be so ugly, cold, tolerant, because. Infection control was so bad at being their country at that time. And it was very difficult to get them to go. I don't know if I'm not discussing black women necessarily, but we have a lot of cultures in this area. And I think some of them are afraid to go. Others don't, can't understand how to get through the system. Mm -hmm. So that is very incredible. The cultural sensitivity is horrible. Right. Um, but the, you know, if, if we were in a hotel, we would have a concierge who would be able to provide us with that. We mm -hmm. would see that on medical institutions and they're far more common. Sure. Than in our classes. Yeah. Thank you. So I think that this other system of somehow inclusion for increased access here, but I don't think it's going to do anything to. Mm -hmm. Medicine isn't in a vacuum. The people that are working in our healthcare system are still operating within a racist society. So just because you're getting more people getting access doesn't mean you reach that out of the You just have more people for that basic model. So the, the idea being if we believe changing the access to healthcare will lead to a change in decreasing or eliminating institutional racism, we may be missing something. I just wanted to reiterate what you were saying. Is that right? Okay. This is it. So this is what I love. I love when we can have conversations that not everyone agrees on, on the right side of the issue, right? I, I think if we all said, oh, we're all on the same page, we're good to go, let's get to this. We, in many ways, will perpetuate the same issue that exists in I say that because it starts from the education of our providers. Uh, how, how many of the folks who aren't students are physicians? We have a physician here, physician, 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 physician. Do you remember when you were learning about hypertension and, or high blood pressure and they would discuss risk factors of those diseases? Was race usually included in that discussion? Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you remember? Not typically. <clears throat> I mean, there's uh, some literature about whether people are African American or something diagnosed, but not typically, and not 
all the other conditions of how the work of the day yeah. So some some folks do remember there wasn't as much practical in your school. Interestingly enough, race is still mentioned today as a risk factor for these diseases. However, I hear however. <laughs> um kidney disease. There are more people. African American people get kidney disease, but my understanding has been it's because of genes you have. Uh, not correct. Not correct. No. Okay. So we have to. We'll, we'll explain this, and uh, this is this is I think why the group brought me in because this is where I do my work and my scholarship and my research and my teaching. In that, when we start pathologizing race as the risk factor or the contributing biological issue that leads to a disease, we now pathologize that human being's race as the issue. Instead of the social determinants that are the environment that encapsulate that individual. But unfortunately, medicine has used race as a really, really poor proxy for what they believe are social determinants, but we should actually be speaking about the social determinants. And what we're trying and a lot of the students here have been loud voices and advocates and saying, we need to have a better learning environment. We have to have a better learning of how we discuss these issues because the reality is your skin color will not be the biological determinant for a disease. And the reason that is true, and I saw him over here, I'm get to you. The reason that is true is because there is no DNA marker that has ever been found that can find someone's race. Because race is a social concept. It was made in 1554 by Blumenbach. And he assigned colors to people based on geography. And essentially turned into a taxonomy of hierarchy, power, as you may know, which started from the top by Europeans. There are geneticists that say we cannot sit on this idea that race is the biological market that we're going to start differentiating the from. And the reason that's important, the reason it's important is because if we do that, we are literally saying what Sam Morton attempted to say through his fictional science, that black people or people of color are inherently less intelligent because of the cranium size or because their DNA is different. He even believed they were different species. And we say, well, what does that have to do? I came here to hear about universal health care <laughs> and single care. What does this have to do with this? I did see a hand. I want to get to your hand. If someone wanted to speak. Oh, I just wanted to respond to that. Yes. Um, just because right now we're learning about the introduction of class. Um, so one thing I learned about a couple days ago, actually, was that one of the main measurements of kidney function is something called the molecular function and if a person is defined as African American by the physician, then you use different variables to determine their molecular What that variable does essentially is correct for saying that this person has higher muscle mass. So a higher creatinine level, which means you have a higher creatinine level, which means your um, kidneys aren't functioning well. So you're saying that you have a higher creatinine level that's inherently normal for a black person. Because as a black person, you inherit to have more muscle mass. So what ends up happening is that African Americans with a high branding level, maybe that should have been looked at with further analysis, that's ignored as normal because they're black and these two other points. You can find kidney diseases later. And that might be why you see more black people with kidney disease in addition to other social problems. So it's built in to the system that already like institutionalizes those things. And no one really Great example, GFR. GFR has already been proven to, to not be effective. It actually was, if you look at the primary sources of the literature, GFR was based on a study of a population that was so small that you couldn't truly <clears throat> extrapolate that black people had higher muscle mass than white folks. But physicians in here, if you plug it in, you have to choose are they black or not. 
So I'm, I'm not an Enoch. Where do I fall in that? <laughs> and so the, the, this idea of race and how we use race in medicine starts to crumble when we start asking these critical questions. And I bring it up here because I think we have to think about it so directly when we're talking about a universal access to healthcare. Because for marginalized communities, what that means for me is not just that we have access to care, but we have access to care that will save our lives. The same way we'll treat everyone else who wants access to care. Because at the moment, the disparities are continually growing, and it's showing that our healthcare system disproportionately <coughs> harms communities of color, marginalized communities, immigrant communities, monolingual communities. And if we're going to push this, which I will get behind, I want to make sure that we're having these conversations. And so we say, well, how do you change that? We're just saying people should get access. A potential argument is, what if in the legislation, it requires that medical school and medical education, that there is a training that is relevant to the communities that need it most? Because at the moment, there isn't. There's an LCMD that comes and says, you're accredited or you're not, and then they leave. But they don't determine who provides education. They don't determine if someone is getting better health outcome. They just say, the learning environment is good enough for us. You're an accredited medical school. And then that leads me to another conversation of incarcerated folks, who potentially, I, I've read through both of the bills in the Senate and the House. And there isn't a discussion of folks that are incarcerated. Do they receive the health care or do they not? The assumption is they do because they're residents. And that's the language that's used in the bill. But there's a lot of states that strip your citizenship rights. The moment you have been found guilty of a federal crime. And when you come out, you have states like Florida that just passed legislation that allows someone who was found guilty of a felony to vote. There's other states that don't allow you to vote at all. What stops the state from saying you can't vote and you cannot receive health care? I think that's another question we, we have to critique and we have to explore when we're discussing universal health care. I'm wondering what folks in here think should be the answer to the incarcerated. They're here. They're human. They're covered. That's simple. Yes. Other thoughts? And the interesting note about this is there are some people that are going to say this is the next point of the about immigrant community or undocumented folks. Is that by definition, they do not fall under the bills that are proposed in the House and in the Senate. It says that you must be a resident, and the term resident is defined by the Secretary of Health Services. And most likely, they haven't defined it yet, most likely they will refer to the Federal Immigration Department and say, what is a resident? The basic assumption is that you, you're holding a group. Maybe they, they could be more stringent and say, no, you have to be a U.S. citizen to be considered a resident. Yeah, to build on that, one thing that we've been discussing is that residence in the current situation is going to be defined strictly by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And currently, that's Alex Azar. And so, on an administration by administration basis, is the definition of resident going to be changing every four years? And so, are we going to have to adjust accordingly? Right. Additionally, you know, it just creates that sort of space for racism and these other biases to actually come to fruition because, I don't know, it's frustrating because all these, uh, like, Gorilla's campaign, Bernie's campaign, they say health is a human right, and that with these bills, everybody's in and nobody's out. But we can, clear, we can clearly see from this language that it's creating a space for uh, this sort of two tiered health system where you have your residents and then your non residents. Your people who get out there who live in the state of London, right. they rely on emergency services or, or some other. Board. And the, the importance of that, yeah, go ahead. 
one of the important things that's happened between Washington State in the last year is about specific islanders, which is a great example where the United States actually has a treaty with this foreign country because we bombed the hell out of them and caused all kinds of cancers and, and effects on their environment that a number of specific islanders have moved to the United States. Yet, that treaty has been overwritten because they're considered immigrants, and we were not allowed to give them Medicaid, or not allowed to give them food stamps, housing assistance, which all have a big impact on health. And Washington State Legislature last year actually passed a law to say, yes, we can. We can honor that U.S. treaty here in Washington State, right? Uh, and it's a little battle, yeah, but it's a great example of how people are discriminated against and just not having access. Sure. And I think you, you should like the importance of fighting this on both the state and federal level. Right. So currently, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of Apple Health, Apple Health, Apple Health, Apple Health. Uh, it's an amazing program, but you also need to have 10 years of residency. Yeah. <coughs> To become a citizen. No, to receive uh, the health care through the state of Washington, even if you're not a citizen. Uh, that's a long time. And what happens between the time of residency to receiving that Apple Health is that you can only, as John mentioned, you can only receive health care services if it is an absolute emergency. You cannot receive preventative care. There was a gentleman here in UDEP who had diabetes, showed up, and they said it's, it's not an emergency yet. And he has to come back when it became severe. Uh, I heard the story of another uh, location where diabetes was the, the disease, and what the families were doing were eating foods that would cause them to lose consciousness so that they would be brought into the ER. That's that in the United States in 2018. Uh, so the question is, how do we provide to get to the ER? How do we, that's my point. Uh, how do we provide a piece of legislation that prevents that type of thing from occurring? Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to comment. When you look at you can see the special care from a general service here in the and I think the limitations you have in my back up here, uh, that the specialist uh, it is important. I mean it's very difficult to get patients coverage to receive some specialty care when you can have to do that out of here. So just even in our system, yes, it's great that it's available, but it's horrible to have insurance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's gonna be some on in the middle. And on the right, they're going to say, no, these are not citizens. They do not deserve our money. They do not deserve our taxes. Why are we taking care of people who are coming over the border, quote, unquote, illegally, and deserve the right to health care? It's, it's even in the bill that says they will prohibit, that they're essentially alluding to uh, hospital terrorism, that people will just come here to seek care. Um, which which happens in other other parts of, of the world for sure. That also, in the same, the same breath, prohibits or is at least targeting a community that is incredibly marginalized. And an argument that we can put forth is: these are people who contribute to this economy on a regular basis. If you go to the store and you're buying something, you've paid sales tax. You purchase the car, you pay sales tax. Undocumented folks pay income tax in many states. But yet, we consider them excluded from the benefits that, that we offer. And I would say collectively that we should push and say, no, undocumented folks that are here should receive this benefit. And I'm sure it's going to be a push. And no one's going to have to negotiate with folks. But I think on the community level, there could be quite a bit of pressure to force that conversation to happen. Yeah. So everything we've talked about um, 
is an issue with our current healthcare system and the inequalities that currently exist. Something that I'm thinking about is why would it be the responsibility of a new single payer system to necessarily address those as it's being passed? So we have many of these inequalities and we're okay with them essentially to the point where many of us in this room may not openly advocate, we may not think about them every day or I'm not okay. Right, you're not. Okay. There, but for example, people may not think about them every hour, every day, every week. So if we were to pass a single payer system, why do you think we have to pay so much attention to these sorts of ideas right at the forefront, as opposed to increasing access to care for everybody, having a positive benefit from that, and then saying, what more can we do? That's a good question. You have yeah, I am. So I guess I don't know what the percentage is, but it is, I guess your question to me brings up a lot similar to what everyone has been saying about you know how much are the inequities that we face in in health outcomes really do have people having access to care, right? Because it's like pretty small, and so I think I struggle with that question because it feels like we're sort of kicking the can down the road for something that we know isn't actually going to do that much for people, right? Like this amazingly eloquent person behind me was saying, if we are opening access to everyone, but it's shitty care, like, is that is that really a win? Are we willing to settle for that? And I think the harder question for me is, how can we actually redefine what we are talking about as health? Right, like if we're talking about health insurance, can that also include access to food, transportation, like all these other things? So if we can switch it up, because we should, because it's a broken system, can we actually blow out what we're insuring people for? I guess I can see why it'd be better to take the can down the road and, and improve our very bad healthcare system rather than trying to come into this big truck of racism that I don't think that we can expect to make much of a dent in the next five years, no matter how good the intentions of everybody in this room is. So that was the same argument that LBJ made when they were trying to pass equal voting rights. And I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm saying at some point we have to deal with the issue. And yeah, we can we can kick it. Uh, I'm just tired. I'm I'm tired of seeing patients and colleagues and family members who are suffering and we're saying just hold on a little bit longer because we promise you that we will provide better care then. Uh, and, and I'll be frank, the second that it's passed as it is, it is so difficult to amend. And I say if we're going to hit a home run, let's, let's prep it. Let's say we're going to go so hard that the Republican Party the moderates are going to come and say, no, that is, that's crazy. You can't do that. You say, what was crazy is that you were killing people because they have no access to health care. And now we're saying we're going to provide access to health care to everyone. And you're going to do it in a way that is equitable and that is not racist. Uh, I saw it in here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was, what I'd like to say is, I don't think we have to kick anything down the road. I think you can do all going to be really hard, right? I think this is the NAP platform is really to be fair, to be decent about care. I hope people don't have any illusions that health care needs to be right? Decent, but it's an easy start, right? You can get everybody to crash on that. But we should still be working on this team. We should still be working on social terms of health care. If you read the studies, it's anywhere between 10 and 90 percent. So we don't know exactly, but we think it's long, right? So clearly we have to work on all this stuff, but I love this discussion because yes, if we can make if we can tweak this and take it into account as best we can, it's great. We still have to fight for everyone else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. That doesn't mean we can pick anything else down with it. Work on DHP, work on all the other systems. Um, that way we can actually be together on this. I don't think any any means of everyone needs like you sound like a physician. I love you. The physician are like, let's bring it. I'm I'm the organizer who like gets the least she's fired. And we're like, we're gonna shut this place down. But the reality is we need both, right? We, we need to be able to think about this and say what's gonna move forward and and folks still nagging along the way saying, hey, let's not forget this. But 
I think the unfortunate part about a lot of these conversations is that it's made to be an either or, where either you get affordable health care or you have to deal with all this other racism stuff that's kind of secondary. But the unfortunate part and what we don't realize and not off the top in our medical education is how the negative implications of not dealing with this two sides racism and the lack of care that we give to our marginalized people actually cost our health care system more. And we've actually seen a decline in the life expectancy of all U.S. populations. Well. So this idea of there's this certain set of people that get a disparate amount of care, and that's a problem that's over here, without recognizing the interconnectedness of the human experience here in the U.S., and that when those people get less care, it actually has a negative impact on the entire health system, and thus the majority of people, including white people, get worse care, and thus everybody suffers. But it's almost like you continue to create these, these hey, excuse me. <laughs> 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 we create this economy that these two separate worlds exist, and not that the, we don't appreciate the interconnectedness of those two worlds. And I think that's the unfortunate part that we have to then convince each other and convince other physicians the importance of the other group, the others, without recognizing how they are actually impacting our care overall. If you haven't looked at the WHO life expectancy and how that has declined in the US over the years, as our disparities continue to go up, you would actually, that's something I would implore anybody who has a debt to take a look at that data. Because the data is there. We actually just ignore it. Can you find your two worlds? The two worlds of those who are minorities who are receiving disparate care and thus costing more services and money, and the white majority. Yes. So I'm an advocate or a I advocate whereas because I think that whereas is where we set our values. And it gives us then an opportunity to revisit over and over and over at every time we even touch the healthcare system, an opportunity to state our values and to check in to see is this you were watching this happen over here, this kind of what among this population, we need to revisit this because they're not doing something, we're not doing something right. And I think most of medicine just inherently because you guys go into medicine because you want to do something for humanity. You want to make a positive impact in the world that we live in and on the people that we love and care about. And that's really what we all really should be doing that. When whereas state give us the bigger picture, whereas. And I think that Vermont was a really good example of that. Vermont made statements that healthcare is a human right. And if healthcare is a human right, who are we going to say can't have healthcare? Whether they're incarcerated, whether they're black, whether they're married or unmarried, or they're LGBT. If you hear whatever, if you're from Mars or from the Earth, if you're a human being, you deserve yeah. And then we start at a place where we can say, no, we can't just say no. They have a right when they're not going to do it. If they're children, they have the right to help care. If they're 86, 92, 113, it doesn't matter. We have to go to healthcare. And we need to then think about the kind of care that we give them. Yeah. And, and I, I humanity is yeah. the humanity is where their dignity is. Yeah. And that's what we have to go And I love it. I some critical race theorist. And uh, when I hear what you said. I completely agree, and I think it's the truth. The reality is this country doesn't see everyone as human. Doesn't right. matter. Oh no, it, it, that their, that their institution, their state, their city, their county, their school, all has to go back to the whereas state. 
And they need to, right. They need the thirteenth. So the thirteenth amendment is a whereas statement that says you shall be slavery shall be abolished except except if you are duly convicted of a crime. You are no longer a human. You are a slave. If we, if they strip people of their humanity in this country. They've done it for generations. Right? The first Congress in this country said you are only a citizen if you are a white land owning man. But that's, a, that's another uh, opportunity for us to pass a different piece of legislation. No, I agree. We also have to fight, is what I'm suggesting. Uh, was your hand in there? We can't hear you. Collectivism has come together in a holistic sense for the greater good of our democracy, our US organization, but coming from a collective approach so that that minimizes the, uh, the differences between the different minority versus the majority by concept. What can I say? Where if we come to like this is causing for us to look the uh, white population does large base base of people white they can't afford it. But we don't ever look at that we just classify everybody as they're white as far as them being white here in privilege. Which they are privileged as far as this is what I mean by privilege. And everyone knows what you are privileged. But still we talk about financial status of people who can afford health care in West Virginia and all these other areas where all percentages of white Communities set and um, the state carries a lot of of poverty there and it's predominantly white. Yeah. So there are many states like that. So how can you see it from a collective point of view and approach from that without not necessarily negating the minority platform or the community platform? But I think if there's a popular approach from that perspective as a collective. As for poverty across the board, maybe the fight to, to move forward for white fertility takes place through the process of moving up the legislation, the legislative world of the House and the Senate. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I don't disagree with you. I the point of, uh, no, no, you made a good point. I, I'm 100% on board. I will stand in solidarity with every poor white person in this country because the oppression is synonymous. I don't know if the inverse is true. The inverse, if the poor white person would stand with me, it's out there. <laughs> well, I think the possibility would be because the village outweighs the separation. Oh no, I'm, I'm with you. The Black Panthers organized in the Appalachian Mountains in the 1960s with white folks. I guess that is the work we have to do, absolutely. And simultaneously, this is what it comes down to. I think a lot of people hear me like, oh, you're a race hater, you want to separate people based on race. We just support black people and we don't care about white people. That's absolutely not what I'm talking about. I, I critique systems, economic systems that we're currently in because capitalism is oppressive. The capitalism is also racist. And so if we don't acknowledge the true reality of it, we start having gaps in our organizing and again, how we collectively move. Right, I I organize on the forefront of trying to dismantle institutional racism and economic oppression because they come from the same source. Uh, but that work is very difficult because some people say, "No, Edwin, this isn't just a Black Lives Matter thing. This is a All Lives Matter." Right, because then that's the slippery slope we start getting into. And and my response is. But Black Lives Matter is all lives. When we, when in my mind, if we support and uplift the most marginalized communities in this country, including poor white folks, everyone else <coughs> will indefinitely do better. <coughs> Without a doubt. I mean, the statistics prove it, the data is there, everything is there. There are just some people who literally vote against their own interest in this country. I extend a hand all the time. I'm like, come on, let's go. Let's do some organizing. Let's work. And the response is, oh, no, no, you don't understand my issue. And so I, I think you're right. I think we have to find a way to collectively organize. But it takes 
multiple conversations like these. Uh, and I love these conversations because the easy conversations we all come in here and agree that we need to hear the difficult conversation is when someone says, Oh, Edward, I don't know if I completely agree with you on this issue. I say, Great, let's talk about that one then. Uh, I saw some hands go up. We'll go with John uh, here. I'm sorry, I didn't mention Ryan. 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 Yeah, um, I really like where this discussion is going. I kind of want to backtrack a little bit too <laughs> around how we're framing this argument of why it has to be single payer universal health care. And I think Sermon had a really interesting point, but I would also argue that you know we're at such a pivotal moment in our nation's history of reforming our entire health care funding system. Right. And I think it's an argument of why not? Right. So if, if we're going down this, this road of healthcare reform and passing universal healthcare, you know, if leaving out minority populations or vulnerable populations is what it takes to get this bill passed, like I, I don't think that that's a good road to go down. That's not a good argument and a good way to frame this. How we should frame this is that not passing healthcare reform to address these minority issues, vulnerable population issues, is an act of not to doing anything, and that, that in and of itself is an act of structural violence of where we are at an op we have an opportunity to address these issues, and not addressing those is an actual act of violence and an act of complacency as well. And I just want us to like think about that in the background. So one of the questions I hear people asking is why are we spending all this time on universal health care or trying to make sure everyone is included when we know that health is determined by other costs like housing, allowing food, by giving people jobs, satisfying lives. And uh, as an activist for way too many years, sure. uh, I, I know that this is a part of all those other issues mm -hmm. that by wanting to improve or give increased access to health care is a message that the people in control of who gets health care really need to be, we need to make some noise to shake them up. That, yes, we work really closely with housing advocates. We work really closely with uh, union activists who are trying to protect the spread jobs. We work really closely uh, with uh, racial movements that are uh, looking at immigration and, uh, and our current, you know, racism. And, in, in our society, and that this is a part of making that happen. If we can do it, even you know, on um, you know, to the next step or the next step after that, uh, that we are going to be impacting all these other systems. And we can't not do it if I don't, you know, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? Yeah, and I don't think now, anyone disagrees with you. I think we all agree with the issue here. I think the hard question is the nuance of. How deep into the structural issues will we get? Or is it this is one step towards a contributing factor of a number of things? And that's just a difference in tactics, right? But people on the inside, the, the people that are providing the care and that are seeing this racism in our own clinics and our own hospitals, we are the ones who are going to really bring that to light and are going to make that. We don't do it, right. you know. I think we are a key part to making that happen. Yeah. And I think the message of this, at least where I was right here, was to say, can we move that message along as folks are in those rooms with Camilla, as they are in those rooms with the other Congress folks, with the state legislature, is saying, let's not let's not forget this is happening. I heard it from the physicians in the room that this thing is happening. The students are saying this is an issue. Uh, because that, that voice needs to be heard. Because I'll be frank, I follow universal health care, and I don't hear racial justice as much as I would like to hear. Uh, I don't hear as much about immigration justice as I would like to hear. Um, and that turns into a very Western-centric conversation of health care for citizens, um, which is not what everyone in this room, as you hear, agrees upon. But I'm sure there's some folks that say, no, it should only be for citizens. And we need to figure out which route we're going to take. Uh, I think part of that um, getting more physicians to be activists go back to what we were talking about. 
This it seems, I mean, I'm grateful to that he does. He does have a long way to go when it comes to about the way that socioeconomics, race, and all those views play into healthcare. And it seems that anytime an ill health is mentioned, it's either these people, um, like black people, face this, Latino people face this, immigrants face this. Almost as if the reason that they're facing those health problems is inherent in the fact that they're immigrant, inherent in the fact that at their particular race rather than thinking about it as a whole. So when you're going to go and have discussions about healthcare, people will say, well, why should we talk about this? That's not related to healthcare, that's related to that person's lack of That's why they think they're so much. So you're teaching it kind of backwards. I think as you go into medicine and like residency and you're getting more and more um, disheartened by everything, that, that kind of carries on towards your activism where you're forgetting that. Any other? Yes, here, here. On a positive note. <laughs> this is not positive? Northwest Kidney Centers, and I know a lot about kidney disease. Um, and I do fundraising for them. They are a nonprofit organization and they don't turn anyone away. No one. So that's a good resource. They dialyze anyone. Wow. And here.
That's not the reality. And it's okay for it to not be the reality. I just want us to walk into it knowing the reality so that we can address it. Please. Yeah, so been thinking about the fact that other nations that have universal health systems and other developed nations, and that's primarily Europe, but not exclusively Europe, they spend more on social infrastructure than they spend on their health care. We spend more on health care by a large margin than we spend on social infrastructure. Um, and I, we can't solve all of that instantly by putting single payer in place. But we should have that in mind, mm -hmm. that, that these social problems um, need more money. They need more effort at understanding the need for a, a social infrastructure that, that deals with some of these things. Now, a lot of European nations are stressed right now and are having trouble with what has worked before. So it isn't like there's a perfect system out there and all we have to do is adopt it. Um, uh, uh, countries are struggling. Perhaps the one that's struggling the least is Taiwan. Now, Taiwan, how mixed a population is there in Taiwan? Well, there is, there is, but it's not huge. Um, they, because Taiwan, you know, they have indigenous Taiwanese who are Polynesian as compared with the Chinese that came in in the 17th century. So anyway, but they, their system works better because it's a more uniform society. We have a society that is not uniform and that's great. In the long run, that's what it is. And that's what your daughter is going to be. And my grandchildren are, are half Taiwan, well, yeah, half Taiwanese and half uh, white American of some a variety of backgrounds. Um, and so if you want to get into mixtures, you got it. Um, and that's probably true of a lot of other families. So it's, it's a longer um, struggle. And uh, Improving our healthcare system goes back to what I said initially, which is it's a platform. You've got a lot of work to do on top of that platform. We also spend a lot of time in the military. We also have the largest prison population. That's right. We've got lots of problems. Uh, which are all inextricably bound to each other, right? And the reason I brought up incarcerated, the yeah. incarcerated community is that's 2 million people that are no longer full citizens of this country. They lost their citizenship by becoming prisoners of the United States. That is a, a fascinating phenomenon. I mean, we're talking about a prison population by a factor of five for the next country. That's a scary thought that there's people in there. And, and I think healthcare, so it, I'll make this point. If you go to prison, you get health care. Yeah. There was a guy who held up a bank in uh, Mississippi, I think, several years ago. Yeah. Um, so that he could get, he had uh, cancer and he needed to get it treated. So he went and held up a bank <laughs> so he could be, uh, uh, it's a federal crime. Right. So he went to federal prison and he got his testicular cancer treated. Which, which on so many levels is a, it's so sinister that someone would have to do that to receive care right. for their illness. And simultaneously, the arguments outside of prison are that certain people can't receive health care. But there, but if you commit a crime, you would. And, and I'm not arguing that crime is good or bad. I'm arguing that uh, this is the economic <laughs> medical system that is pressuring people to make some pretty bad decisions. John, I know you're talking about that. Yeah, 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 so I'm actually going to go now. But um, I just wanted to like go back to what you said about how we talk about these vulnerable populations and you know, minority populations and how we need to dissect the health, how the health system addresses those medical needs. But it's one of the reasons that I wanted to put this talk together was also just to have these conversations and just being able to talk about the person before dissecting it. And talking about it in these community settings, I think it's, 
is a great first step. And I appreciate you coming out and speaking to us. So, everyone, let me give you a round of applause.